Uh, I have seen a lot of things in my 40 years of covering science uh, and being surprised by science that I see. Um, I think one of the most surprising things having to do with oceanography in the ocean is when I had Oliver Sacks, the famous neurologist, as a guest coming on my program. And he heard through his publicist, and we talked to his agent, whatever, he heard that the interview following mine, following him, I'm going to interview Oliver Sacks, he heard that it was with a researcher searching for a giant squid in the South Pacific. I don't remember that story a few years ago. And he said, Ira, can I stay on for that interview? <laughs> Oliver, you can do anything you want, you know? And he, I said, why? He said, giant squid are my favorite subject. <laughs> Oliver Sachs, the famous neurologist, he, he said, yeah, can I just sit? I said, you can even help me with the interview if you want to. So, so Friday showed up, and Oliver Sachs showed up in a squid outfit. <laughs> Can't make this up. He had a giant squid t-shirt on with a giant squid on it, and he had two rubber squids in his hands, and I have the picture to prove it. <clears throat> so you never know where these things, you know, where, where basic research or who you're going to be interviewing, what their real interests are. But a lot of times, it takes you back to the sea. And it takes me back to the sea here, and I'm very happy to be here. And, and, and the topic I have chosen, speaking of Oliver Sacks, is, and, and speaking of the, the challenges that science is going through these days, and we'll get into that a little bit, is that science, science is sexy. I mean, you know this from your research as scientists that science is sexy, but actually the public is now getting into science as being sexy after many, many years of being out in the wilderness when science wasn't sexy. I'm going to show you tonight how it is how science sexiness is being shown in, in the public eye and how it's regaining popularity and what kinds of challenges we face. And my first example is, is with these cheerleaders. All these cheerleaders are scientists. I'm a former uh, Washington Redskins cheerleader. Got a undergraduate degree in molecular biology. I Look at worked at NIH for a couple years. Then I went to law school at Georgetown University. I was a patent attorney. And after that, I went to medical school at George Washington University. She's not done. <laughs> and then I moved to Houston, Texas and did an internship in general surgery. And now I'm an emergency medicine doctor in uh, Houston, Texas. Science! Science cheerleaders are dynamic, engaging, well-rounded women, and flat out amazing. <laughs> Science cheerleaders are smart, they're funny, they're entertaining, they're engaging, but most importantly, they're an incredible source of inspiration to millions of young women. Go science! You get the point. Now, who would have thought that science cheerleaders <laughs> would be popular? They, they, this is this former cheerleader, Darlene, Darlene Cavalier, and she formed science cheerleaders. And these are sexy science cheerleaders. They're showing you that science can be sexy and, and, and is becoming sexy. Now, when you and I were growing up, <clears throat> science wasn't too sexy. I mean, we had Mr. Wizard, Don Herbert, and he would come on. I'm sure you all remember Don Herbert. This is not a sexy view of science sitting there with a student. It was informative. It was sort of interesting if you were a geek, right? If you're a science geek or a student, but it wasn't sexy. Neither was this guy. <clears throat> science was for wrinkled old men with bad hair days. <laughs> and in fact, that's the image that Hollywood wanted us to see all the time, is science. It became sort of the butt of jokes, right? <laughs> this is the stereotypical scientist shown after Albert Einstein. And this one comes from young Frankenstein, right? But you could see, you could see the same image of that mad scientist in Back to the Future, other kinds of television and, and all kinds of movies. That was the image of science. It wasn't very sexy. Scientists weren't sexy. They were wacky people. And they didn't know how to dress or, 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 or really uh, act socially. All that changed when this guy came around. <laughs> this is sexy. <laughs> It became sexy about 30 years ago. In fact, last month was the 30th anniversary of the first broadcast of the Cosmos series. And it was, you know, a guy with good looks, a turtleneck, 
He had a distinctive way of speaking. He, his groundbreaking series Cosmos brought science into the homes of billions of people <laughs> around the world and he made science sexy. And science had to be sexy and Cosmos was created because we were at the peak of the Cold War where the, the world had 50,000 nuclear weapons at that time and half of all the scientists in the world were working on nuclear weapons back then. It's hard to believe today, but that's, you know, that was the challenge facing our country back then in the Cold War days was, was, sci was, was nuclear destruction. Today we have different challenges. <laughs> These are all facts. I mean, I didn't make this up. 40 percent, the challenges we face, like 40 percent of the population thinks that the Flintstones were real. <laughs> they believe that the Flintstones really existed. People really existed at the same time that dinosaurs did. Although they were millions and millions of years apart, 40 percent of the population thinks that they lived at the same time. 53 percent of the population doesn't know that the Earth goes around the sun in one year. <clears throat> it takes 365 days for the Earth to go around the sun. And then you have a whole bunch of people who believe that the Grand Canyon and the Earth is only 6,000 years old and the Grand Canyon was caused by Noah's flood. <laughs> there are a lot, a lot of millions and millions of people in this country who believe that. Not only that, 51% of people believe in UFOs and that's a lenticular cloud and you folks would recognize this uh, and this is a really good one but the people, 51% of the population believes that UFOs exist and there's nothing you can tell them that's going to change that. And then what's even more frightening <coughs> is that an analysis, uh, an analysis by the Center for American Progress shows that half of more than new Republican Congress members are skeptics on global warming. Half of them do not believe in global warming and that, that, that fight is going to be engaged by the American Geophysical Union, you might have heard about it this week. They're going to try to bring some truth to the issues of global warming and it's up to scientists to speak out when they get the opportunities to talk about the truth. Even our smartest citizens, our physics students graduating from Harvard like this one, don't know the correct answer to simple questions. There's a very famous film that's called A Private Universe. It was created by the Annenberg Foundation. They went to the Harvard graduation about 15 years ago and they set up a camera and they interviewed all the graduating students. So they had their caps and gowns on. There were about 33 of them in the class. They interviewed the professors. They interviewed everybody they could. And they asked them one simple question. Why is it hotter in the summer than it is in the winter? <laughs> and here's what they said. As the Earth travels around the sun, it gets nearer to the sun, um, which produces warmer weather and gets farther away, which produces colder weather. This student studied physics, planetary motion, and all kinds of other science at Harvard. And he couldn't answer the simple, show the simple reason that it's hotter in the summer than it is in the winter because the earth is tilted. And when I, when I talk about this in a crowd and I ask the same question, I get, still get that same answer. Of course, what they didn't ask the follow-up question is, why is it winter in Australia at the same time that it's summer? But a tremendous, these, these are our leaders of tomorrow. You can go through college and get a four-year degree, even at Harvard other schools, without taking a course in science, without knowing the most basic rudimentary facts about science, and then you can go on to Congress and not believe 50% <coughs> about global warming, and that illustrates some of the problems we have today. We also have another problem, is that we are losing our journalists who actually cover science and know the difference between all these facts. Uh, right before President Obama was sworn in, right after his election, right when he talked about restoring science to its proper location, proper respect, CNN did a very smart thing and they fired their whole science unit. 
They fired them all, including Miles O'Brien, who's one of the most intelligent reporters around. He's been covering science, and not only that, he's a great journalist and can speak on his feet, and, and he's terrific at it. They fired everybody there because why do we need science coverage anymore? Um, Miles has since gotten a new job at PBS where you might be seeing him doing other things. Uh, it's, it's not just television. Here is a, a Columbia Journalism Review article at the, the Boston Globe kills health and science section but keeps its staff. The Globe is owned by the New York Times, which probably has the most famous science section, Tuesday science section of anybody. There used to be 70 science sections in newspapers around the country. There are probably just a handful left. When newspapers get into trouble, what's the first thing they cut? Science. Who needs science, you know? You know? What we need is a rejuvenation of science. And, and, and the juxtaposition of this is very interesting. This is a Pew study for people in the press. And they asked the public where they get all their science. They get their science from a lot of different, or, well, lots of different places. And they asked them, what topic is there not enough coverage of? And all the topics that we have, what topic is there not enough coverage of? Science. 44%, more than anybody, any other subject, said it's at the bottom of the, of the graph here. They need and they want more coverage of scientific news and discoveries. So just as the newspapers and the TV stations are cutting back their coverage of science, the public is saying just the opposite. We want more of that stuff. And in fact, our own statistics show the same thing. When we talk, these, are the, these are the most popular NPR podcasts. And you can see that Science Friday is right behind Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. <laughs> we are the third most popular, and sometimes second, if you include all of Talk of the Nation, podcast and all of NPR. This is an old figure. We now have 24 million downloads a year of Science Friday topics. This is a science show. Thank you. I think if everybody listening to me tonight signs up for that podcast, <laughs> we can get ahead of wait, wait, don't tell me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pulling for all of us to pull ahead in that statistic. Another really interesting statistic, teenagers' view of society's top contributors. When teens were asked who contributed most to our society's well-being, teachers rated first, if you could see that, I'll show you a little pointer, Teachers rated number one with 32%, but right behind were doctors and scientists in, in the respect that teenagers have for, for, for uh, professions. Ahead of military, way ahead of engineers, pol uh, politicians, forget about that, <clears throat> and other. But teenagers, even though we don't give them credit, they recognize the contributions. Young people recognize the contributions that science and teachers make. And in fact, the good news about science being sexy is that is now, that information is not being lost on the people who cater to teenagers and young adults. And over the last five years or so, we're getting to see the results of those statistics. Where the, where the, where the entertainment industry realizes science is sexy now, let's see if we can give teenagers and young adults more science. Where have you seen it showing up? You've seen it up on popular programs like Numbers. Remember Numbers? It was on every Friday night. In Numbers, it was a show about mathematics. The producers made sure that they put a little tidbit of real math, an explanation of Fibonacci series and a flower, if you remember they did that. They did the, they did the Coke bottle fountain experiment where you put the, the, the uh, candy into the bottle and swooshes up. They explained the physics of that and the mathematics of, of that because the producers believed not only that they had a, a moral obligation to do this, but that teenagers and young adults would like to see that. Mythbusters, one of the most popular shows on cable. Teenagers love it. And I did a show called Newton's Apple many years ago, and frequently when the producers and I of the show, it's been off the air now for quite a number of years, we discuss, gee, if we had kept Newton's Apple going, what would it have morphed into? Probably a show like Mythbusters. And Mythbusters is a very, very popular program and gaining traction all the time. But my favorite, <laughs> my favorite example of the popularity of science on television and the media 
is this program. Are you all familiar with this? The Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory is a program about geeky physics guys who live together in a sort of a, sort of a Friends, remember the show Friends, they all live together. Well, this, take all the Friends out, pull geeky physics people <laughs> living together, trying to get dates with the girls across the hall. And that's what you have is big, the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory is, the, is one of the most popular shows on television and they talk about real physics. In fact, the Big Bang Theory ratings beat two, two and a half men <laughs> for the first time. I, there's a science audience, I could do that, I thought. Uh, <clears throat> it beat the show, the most popular show on CBS on that night. It beat them for the first time this year. And what show, what episode of that show did it beat them on? An episode that featured Science Friday. <laughs> now, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to take credit for that. This is Sheldon, who is the biggest geek. He just won an Academy, uh, an Academy, not Academy, a, uh, an Emmy for Best Actor for this program. And the producers of uh, of this program called me up and said, we want to create a situation where we could put Sheldon on a talk show. What other talk show could we put him on except Science Friday? Would you help us create a segment with Science Friday? Science is not only sexy on television, but it's also becoming sexy in the movies. I, mean, I don't know if you saw the flash of genius recently with, uh, with uh, Greg Kinnear. Um, it, it was a very popular film. There was also a play about science called The Farnsworth Invention. It's about Philo Farnsworth, who really was a teenager who came up with the original idea for television while he was plowing the field in, his, in, in uh, the Midwest. And he saw these rows and rows of things and said, gee, we could scan a picture that way and thought about the idea. And he had a fight with, ha with uh, David Sarnoff over it, who was the head of RCA. And all, we, uh, in this play, Hank Azaria played David Sarnoff, and so instead of Mo the bartender, you could hear Hank Azaria <laughs> doing David Sarnoff, and he came on the show, and I said, you know, there was an, <clears throat> there's an old saying that uh, a, real, um, a real music aficionado can listen to the uh, William Tell Overture and not think about the Lone Ranger. <laughs> <clears throat> and I think, you know, I, I, I couldn't, as a, as a theater aficionado, go to see Hank Azaria on stage and not think about Mo the bartender. <laughs> and he said he couldn't either. So, so science is also showing up on Off-Broadway. This is playing now, Off-Broadway in the Ensemble Studio Theater. It's funded by the Sloan Foundation. It's called Photograph 51, and it's basically talking about the study, the, the Rosalind Franklin, who actually took this famous Photograph 51 that showed um, the giant X on the photo of the double, the shape of the double helix of DNA and was, was used to uh, talk about the structure and, and, and define the structure. My favorite, and you'll see there's a theme developing here, having to do with women in science. My favorite story about science, on theater science, and has to do with a play called Frequency Hopping. And it's about the, the, the actress first woman ever to do a nude scene in the movies, I think in the 30s, when she was over in Austria. She escaped, came to the country, and um, helped develop um, frequency hopping that we now use in, in, in cell phones and things like that. She helped to develop it for the war effort, and it was never used then, but no one ever heard about it. Now there's a play about it, and soon, hopefully, to be a movie about it. Science is also sexy in the art world. And artist Lynn Fellman, of Minneapolis uh, creates art inspired by science. These are the bases of the DNA here. She takes your DNA, you have your DNA analyzed, she takes it, she constructs artwork and traces back your lineage using your DNA to where you came from and she creates artwork about and around that and her artwork is being you know highly touted and institutions and and, and universities and organizations around the country. She makes giant pieces of this or she makes individual pieces of this using science as a basic f basis for creating new art. We at Science Friday take advantage of all this art. We've now created a whole section called Science and the Arts on our website and we integrate all different aspects that we do on Science Friday with uh, 
with the, the stage plays, the artwork, films and whatever, and we bring all these scientists and their um, counterparts in the arts to talk about what they do. And as I said before, there's sort of a theme developing about women in science. When we were kids and we were studying science, there were no women in science. You never heard of it. Madame Curie was the only woman you could name in science back then, right? Name someone else, maybe Barbara McClinton. You can name somebody else, maybe. But now, women and girls and young women are really stepping up in science. This year's Intel Science Talent Search winner is Erica De Benedictis, and she was one of four finalists. She won it, and there were three other, I think, three or four other women who were finalists who were, who were, who were shown to be above, superior above their, their male counterparts. Women are showing up all over science. Maybe you remember Danica McKellar. Do you remember Danica McKellar? She was the uh, Winnie Cooper on the Wonder Years. Danica McKellar has a whole bunch of books on algebra. This one's on, on mathematics, this one's on algebra. Her latest called Hot X, Algebra Exposed. She had a bestseller called Math Doesn't Suck. <laughs> and these are all bestsellers. These are, these, are, these are math books aimed at young teenage girls. It explains real math in real terms but in a situation that they find themselves living, having to do with boys or, or other kinds of you know, advice to girls, but it's all real math and it really is selling. Women again, the science babe. This is a physicist named Debbie Berbiches. She has her own videos, her own website, where she explains the physics uh, of, of different issues. Her most famous one is the physics of high heels. And she'll do a video on there in which she'll show you that the force on a woman's high heel on that little point is greater than the force an elephant has on the ground with one of his legs. <laughs> and so there's a lot of physics going on in, in everyday life, so you, you, can, you can be fashionable and smart at the same time. And finally, there, to show that science is really sexy, you know it's sexy when the president invites kids to the White House for the first science fair there ever was. Can you believe that 200 plus years of the White House, there was never a science fair at the White House and President Obama had this uh, fair. I'm gonna show you a little clip from the White House of that science fair. We welcome championship sports teams to the White House to celebrate their victories. I've had the Lakers here, I've had uh, the Saints here, the Crimson Tide. I thought we ought to do the same thing for the winners of science fairs. It's great to see science first, and it's great to see them here at the White House. This is, we, we need young people to, dare I say it, change the world. And it's going to be scientists and more specifically engineers that do that. So this is fantastic. This is an in interesting statistic. The most common educational background of CEOs in the SP500 companies. It's actually engineering. It's a printer that removes ink from paper so we can reuse both the paper and ink. This is our physical therapy chair for physically disabled children. This is basically two forms of alternative energy in one car. Some of the stuff that we're seeing is, as far as we're aware, actually very cutting edge. It's, uh, it's quite impressive. It's hard to describe just how impressive uh, these young people are. We can think of Einstein, Edison, all the Franklin, women. and the, the founders of Google and Apple and Microsoft. But now, we've got some other people to think about. I mean, it's just amazing that the science fair, you know, it took so long to get to the White House, and all the young women and girls that were at the science fair showing off their exhibits. But my, my most interesting slide about women in science, <laughs> this is the ultimate indication that science is sexy and that science is hot. The 2010 Barbie doll winner. <laughs> girls were asked to vote. What profession do you want the latest Barbie doll to be? They voted her a computer engineer. <laughs> Can you believe this? <laughs> what I like most about this, besides she has, you know, the geeky shirt on and the laptop, is the sensible shoes. Look at <laughs> The whole picture. When, when Barbie gets to be a computer scientist, you know that science has become sexy and science has become hot in the general public. Not only that, we discovered this year on Science Friday that the 4-H is involved in science. They, the 4-H, I, I found out about it for the four, first time, but they've been doing this for a couple of years or four years now. 
They create a national science, science day every year in which they do a national science experiment. The whole country, all the 4-H people around the country are doing science experiments. So you're just not horse, the horses anymore and cows and things. And we interviewed, you know, the, the head of the national 4-H, you know, and the 4-H stands for head, heart, hand, and health. And I said, you know, you should add a fifth H and make it for hypothesis. <laughs> and they said, dude, that's kind of a good idea. You can, I said, you can steal that. So science is showing up in lots of different places. It's showing up in kids' punk rock bands. I mean, this is Bo Brout from the punk rock band in Decent, and he's wearing a Science Rocks t-shirt. What punk rock kid you, would you think wants to bring science into their band? Not only that, bands themselves, bigger bands, like the Ark Attack, is you, they're using science as performance art. Here they have these giant Tesla coils and things where science stuff is jumping between uh, the performers, using science as a prop. There are invention fairs going on all over the country where kids and young adults are showing what they know how to do. This one happens to be the Maker Fair, a whole series of Maker Fairs that go around the country. This is the Maker Fair from this summer in New York City. And kids are making all kinds of stuff. If you want to see where ingenuity is happening, go to these fairs and see the range of different kinds of creativity that's happening all over the place. And we're going to need these things because we have all these challenges that are coming up that we're going to need smart kids for. There's a lot of work to do creating technologies, and these technologies, all kinds of alternative energies, nanotechnologies, whatever, these hopefully will create the jobs of tomorrow, which we don't have, that are missing from today. Why is the job, I always say, why is it so hard to not to understand why the jobless rate is 10%? Because we don't make anything anymore. Well, of course, there are no jobs, we don't make anything anymore, right? When was the last time you heard the Look for the Union label song sang anywhere, you know? We don't make any clothing. There are no women garment ladies workers to do these sorts of things. We need to create new kinds of technologies that these kids and create jobs here in this, in this country. And, my, and my, my last thought to you, which brings me back to this old image of Einstein. I want to show you that next time someone says to you, I'm no Einstein, you can say, neither is this guy. Because this old Einstein is really not Einstein either. This is what the real Einstein looked like when he was in his 20s and did the theories of relativity and was most creative. And I want to tell you, you look at this guy, this is some sexy science guy, <laughs> even back then. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you about science being sexy.